Philemon. Very good. See, it wasn't a trick question. I was being nice. It's written to Philemon, right? And who wrote it? It says on the top of it, right? Paul. A letter of Paul. Philemon. Did you say that top? Mine says that. And so Paul. The first verse says Paul. You know, little team. These guys are always together. Father and son of faith are writing a letter to Philemon. Now what happened is Paul got put in jail. So Paul's in jail and he's been taken to Rome because he appealed to Caesar. So he's in a, a Roman jail. So we call this a prison epistle because it's written from a prison cell. And Paul's in jail, right? Now he's in a, a halfway decent jail. He's in his own rented house where he was able to stay because he really was found not guilty. So <clears throat> he's he's got to stay for his time of trial. So he's in his own rented house and he's got visitors coming and going. But there's a guard there. Remember what happened to the guards? They all got saved, right? Paul's guards got saved, right? Amen. And the, uh, they thought they were guarding a prisoner. Instead, they got eternal life, right? Kind of reminds me of Nebuchadnezzar. He thought he was taking captives. Instead, he got Daniel. And what did he get? He got eternal life, right? And that's, that. you think you're getting one thing. God has a way of working things for good, right? Even your evil deeds. So here, uh, Paul, a uh, prison, right? And he's writing back. Well, what? Uh, this guy comes through somehow through some circumstances named Omi uh, 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 what's his name? Onesimus. Onesimus. Okay? We'll just call him Dan. And uh, this guy comes through named Onis On Onesimus. I, well, I can't I say that today. I got a tongue twister. That's going to be bad. Well, he comes through and the guy is a runaway slave. Okay? But not only that, he's a thief. Okay, he stole from Philemon. Phile now remember, this is not a, a, a book of the Bible against slavery. This is a book of the Bible about about the managing of an evil system and how to work in this evil system. And uh, you'll see the same thing in Colossians. Uh, just, it just so happens that Philemon lived in Colossae, and the book of Colossians was written there. Colossians chapter four, verse one, talks about how servants and, and slaves are supposed to be together, masters, and what they're supposed to do. Uh, Ephesians is the same thing, uh, which which was down in that same area. So you have this managing of an evil system, and that's what God does. You got to live in an evil system. How many think you live in a godly system? Okay, so we got to learn how to manage this wicked system, right? And our God's managing this wicked system. The slave comes through. He's run away from his master, which is the death penalty. If you go back, if you get caught, you will be put to death. Okay, and that's how you deal with slaves in those days. It's just it's the law. That's what you do. The law says put them to death, and uh, or at least beat them to the point of almost death. Right? And uh, slaves don't run away. Well, this guy also stole from Philemon before he ran away. So he steals and runs. You know, the guy's smart, right? You don't just run away from home. You got to take something to live on. And uh, so he steals from Philemon and takes off, runs into the apostle Paul, right? Gets saved. So Onesimus gets saved. Paul leads him to Christ. And now, Paul says, you can't just stick around here, Onesimus. You've got to go back and make things right. You've got to, he says, but, but listen, I know Philemon. He's a friend of mine. The guy you ran away from, I know personally. Matter of fact, I led Philemon's family to Christ. Philemon is a good guy, Onesimus. He really is. He's got a church in his house. Uh, his son, it appears, it appears as though Philemon's either the pastor or his son is the pastor. And, uh, and uh, his, his, his wife, uh, uh, she's a wonderful lady. And, and listen, you're going to go back to this home, but, but they're good people. But just in case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this letter. Okay? Now take this letter, go back to uh, Philemon, and hand him this letter. Don't lose it. <laughs> Imagine the wind blowing. <laughs> if you show up without this letter, you'll be put to death. But as long as you have this letter, trust me, I know Philemon. He'll do the right thing. Trust me, I know Philemon. He'll do the right thing. And that's what this letter is. So let's read it. It's awesome. Paul, prisoner of Jesus Christ, Lord bless this reading, and Timothy, our brother. That's a, we ask God to do that. We're not telling him. Right? God, please bless the reading. Unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Apia, seems to be his wife, and Archippus, his son, our fellow soldier, unto the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints, 
that the communion, I'm sorry, the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That, that verse is so huge. We could spend weeks on that verse. That's amazing. I, I'd suggest you try to take a look at verse 6, maybe break that down for yourself. Verse 7. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I'd rather beseech thee, uh, being such as one of Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. That means he led him to Christ, he got saved. Which in times past was, uh, was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. The bowels mean the innermost feelings, my gut feelings, my, where the love comes from, the thing you get sick when bad news hits, or, or, the, or the yearning from within. That's what bowels means. Whom I would have retained with me, that in, in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? But if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or owe thee aught, put it on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. I think you recognize the Good Samaritan, I hope. Albert, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self beside. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But with all prepare <laughs> me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, uh, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristocharis, Demas, you read about Demas later, Lucas, and my, my fellow laborer, uh, my fellow laborers, I'm sorry. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Father, thank you for the word. Go beyond the preacher in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Philemon. So as we study this book, we know Paul's writing. So this, this Onesimus, this, this man he led to Christ, will be received back in. If you want to do a great study on how to persuade somebody, this is a great book on persuasion. Paul talks about Philemon, about his own goodness, his own trust, his own faith and his own love and how he's been beneficial to all the saints. He, he talks to Philemon about how Philemon is a joy to him and the effects that Philemon's works has upon him. And then, then he says, Philemon, I would command you because I could. I'm an apostle, but I don't. I beg you. I beseech you, Philemon, uh, that you receive this man because he's precious to me. Receive him as if he is myself. I'm not going to mention to the fact that you owe me your life also. I led you to Christ. Uh, I'm not going to mention how much you owe me. I'm just going to, but he mentions that, right? He brings it up and uh, um, and then he says, I have confidence in you that you're going to go beyond anything I ask. <laughs> now, what does somebody say that to you? What do you think, right? Uh, yeah, but I know, uh, I know you, Andy. You'll, you'll do a, great, a lot more than what I say. <laughs> Andy's like, wow. What do you do with that? Shortcut it, right? <laughs> right? I mean, it's a great persuasion. What's the last thing he says? Oh, by the way, uh, give me a place room ready because I'm coming soon. <laughs> Which means what? I'm going to find out if you did it or not. Right? And uh, I'll know when I come. So, I mean, that's great words. I mean, it's a, it's a great letter in persuasion. You see the Apostle Paul's brilliant mind and an understanding of somebody, but you also know it's, it's spiritual, it's a friend, it's, some, it's honest. He's saying this honestly. He's not manipulating. Um, so Paul's writing here, right? And uh, let me just read a couple of notes that I, that I jotted down here. Listen, uh, there's hardly any. I mean, it's just the introduction, but there's hardly any. Um, it's from Paul and Timothy. It's to Philemon. He's the pastor, most likely. Uh, church is in his house. And in verse 2, he's called a fellow laborer of Paul. We have uh, Apiah, his wife. Remember, God recognizes the pastor's wife. This is pretty interesting, huh? I kind of like that. I like that God recognizes the preacher's wife because very others do. Uh, uh, not in our church, but in other churches. I mean, it's just a great church. Uh, Archippus is his son. Uh, it's the pastor's son. He's, uh, he's called a fellow soldier. It's possible he's the pastor, or maybe they're co-pastors. Or this is a 
runaway slave. But now he's a beloved brother, according to verse 16, and he's Paul's spiritual son, according to verse number 10. Uh, Philemon. Um, Philemon, right? Uh, Paul prays for his faith that it might become effectually, be effectually communicated. And so it's a, just an incredible verse that, that he says there. It's in verse number six where he says that this communication of your faith may become effectual. That means actual. It might actually happen. You know, you meet somebody, they say they're a believer in Christ, but they steal from you. They say they're a believer in Christ, but they don't go to church. They say they're a believer in Christ, but they, 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 they don't know the books of the Bible. They, they couldn't even find Matthew if you needed to. You know, what is that? <clears throat> they may be a believer in Christ. I'm not saying they're not saved. What I'm saying is, is th their faith isn't effectual. It's not actually having an effect. Right? And if your faith isn't having effect, it's possible your faith is not genuine. Right? I can't see your salvation. All I know is if your faith having no effect, faith without works is dead. And dead faith, boy, I, I wouldn't trust in a dead faith that doesn't save me. I mean, that, that would save me. All right? If your faith is dead, are you saved or not? I don't know. I don't know. Good works and the works after trying to be a Christian, oh, that has to do with me. I do that. Why? So I find out whether or not I'm saved. Right? If I can't go to church and live in forgiveness, then uh, am I even saved? God called him a wicked servant that couldn't forgive somebody else after he'd been forgiven so much. Well, I've been offended at church. You don't understand what happened to me. Oh, yes, I do. You can't forgive. And if you can't forgive, you're not forgiven. And as a result, if you're unable to forgive, are you sure you're saved? You might be. I'm not saying you're not. I have no idea. But I know I try to forgive to find out whether or not Christ lives in me. Because if I can't forgive somebody, I'm going to go to God and say, God, why can't I forgive this person? Why can't I, God? I mean, I'm supposed to have the power of God within me. I'm supposed to be saved, the Holy Spirit. How do you know if the Spirit dwells within you? But how, how do you know if you're saved by the Spirit that dwells within you? Well, if the Spirit within me can't do the works of God, then am I sure I'm saved? You know? That's what bothers me if I can't hand out a Bible track or I can't witness to somebody. If I'm too scared to go out and talk to somebody about Christ, that bothers me. Why? Because he's not scared to talk about himself. Right? He loves people. He can, and if there's somebody I can't love, somebody I can't care about, somebody I can't, well, I'm going to worry. Right? Uh, I'm worried if the Bible, if I read my Bible, it doesn't mean anything, I'm worried. Why? Because the author is supposed to live in me and he should tell me something. Right? He should tell me something. And, uh, and I know there's sin that gets in the way and you can't see far off. You've forgotten your purse from your old sin. And I know you can be saved and be in a mess. How many of you are in a mess? <laughs> you can be saved and be a mess, right? But here he says that your faith will become effectual. He prays for this, right? Effectual pray, faith. My faith's real. Why? Because it does something. And that's the only way I know, right? Otherwise, it's just subjective. Is your faith created by you? How many of you want something that's created by you? Right? That's the, the whole tongues movement. That's the whole things that come out. It's, it's self-created, you know, and... Uh, I had a friend of mine involved in that. He said, I pray to ask God, I don't want nothing that doesn't come from God. I don't want anything that's created by myself. That's why I don't like this uh, positive thinking kind of thing. We just you use a mantra, you know, and, uh, you know, and you use this mantra to, to talk to yourself and convince yourself and bolster yourself up. That's why I don't like music. And I, I, I love Christian music. I love to listen to it, but I know it's fake. It makes me go, wow, yeah, yeah, my tears, and, you know, yeah, Jesus is wonderful. But it's, it's, it's created by a man in a man. Right? And, and, if, and, and I want something that's, that's real. I want the Holy Spirit. I can cry a long-distance phone commercial. And that's the same feeling I can get from a Christian song. I want to know the difference. I want to know it's God. I don't want God working in me. And if God can't work in me, then there's something wrong with me. I want to be able to give until I hurt. I want to be able to give until I, I can't give anymore. And then I want to get up and give some more. I want to be able to give everything I've got and get nothing in return. That's what I want to be able to do. I want the power to lay my life down. That's what I want the power to do. And if I, that's the power of God. And that's why I know it's God, right? That's all, I tell you what, that, that's, that's real. That's real faith, right? I, how many want something fake? Aren't you worried you got something fake? Right? And, uh, I, that's what Christian music is, right? It's fake. Because I know what rock and roll can do to the heart. And I know what Christian music can do to the heart. And, and I know the, the facade of that whole thing, right? This is why we don't have a three-hour music service. Right? I don't mind. Me. I love music. Yeah, it lifts the heart. It's a music of the emotions. It's wonderful. I can cry. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, yeah.
There's other reasons to cry. And uh, better reasons, let's say. That's, that's a good reason. I like yesterday. It was yesterday. The other day I was working in the basement. I had some song playing. And I tell you what, they're singing about Jesus, and I'm singing about Jesus, and a tear get in my eye, and I can't see the stinking nail. <laughs> like, like, shut that stupid music off till I get this wall built. Okay. <laughs> Amen. That's, that's good. Yeah. Don't do it while you're driving. Um, yeah. Praising the Lord while you're driving can be dangerous. Both hands. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Right. And, uh, so anyway, we got off of that. Paul, um, he decides not to command him. In verse number, uh, uh, where, where was it? Uh, verse number 8. Wherefore, though I, I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin, that word enjoin means command. Paul says, I'm an apostle. I led you to Christ. I could command you to do this, but I would rather not. I would rather just, just say, listen, I'm Paul the aged. I'm your friend. I care about you, and I want to beseech you, hey, can you do what's right? Paul led to Christ, according to verse number 10, and in verse number 12, Paul sent him back. Paul's the one sending him, right? Okay, that's good. That's good. Yes, Paul is doing that. Paul sent him back. He says, listen, you've got to do what's right. Sometimes you've got to make reprobations for the things you've done wrong in your life. Right? Right? According to the law, if you steal, you have to return four times the amount. So if you stole $10 from somebody, you owe them 40 That's according to the law of God. Well, that's nice, isn't it? Right? Sometimes you can't go back and make amends. Right? Somebody's passed away or something's gone or they're, just, they're gone out of the way. But, but you need to make the attempt. You need to make the attempt. Before I can marry somebody, if they're divorced, I have to make sure they've made the attempt to reconcile and then to, with their previous marriage and, and then make that marriage and close that door to that marriage. They have to make that right before they can move on. And sometimes you've got to go back and make it right. right? And you can't always make it right. right? But at least you can go back, go, go back and say, hey, I was wrong in what I did. I'm sorry. Hey, they moved on. They've remarried. But you can go back and say, hey, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? I did wrong. Because if you take that bitterness from the old marriage into the new marriage, it's going to wreck the new marriage. You know? So sometimes you've got to go back. And Paul says to him, listen, you need to go back, Onesimus. You need to go back and make this right. You stole from him and ran away. Right? You, need to go make, you need to make this right. Sometimes that, that happens in the faith, and sometimes you have to do that kind of stuff, and it's tough. Nobody said being a Christian is easy. God's provision may... Uh, uh, now, uh, he says to Philemon, you look in verse number uh, 15, uh, he says, God's provision may have been at work here. For perhaps, therefore, he departed for a season that thou shouldest receive for life. Hey, God was at work here. And, and he, this guy ran away and stole from you, Philemon, but I want you to look at the bigger picture. Okay? <laughs> God used him to bring him to me, get him saved, and now God's bringing him back. Philemon, there, there may have been a bigger picture here. Romans 8, 28 is still at work. All things work together for good. you got to trust God. Well, I just don't believe that's going to work together for good. I was at church. The guy backed into my car and drove away. What kind of a church member does that? Well, most of them. Well, what kind of church member would do that? I mean, we're all honest until it's going to cost us $1,000. Right? Well, I, I, why would I go to church if that's the kind of people that go to church? Well, what kind of people do you think go to church? Uh, let me, I'll give you your first memory verse, Romans 3.23. Don't ever forget it. For all... You see that person across the pew? They're wicked. Right? You know what the good news about evil people in church? You fit in. Right? <laughs> I fit in here. Why? Because he just backed in my car and drove away. Huh. Wait till I see him at Walmart. <laughs> listen things like that will happen hopefully nobody does that at church but things like that can happen right things like that will happen but do you trust the Lord all things work together for good well not some idiot backing into my car how can that work together for good faith faith God's more worried about growing you than he is the looks of your car you know that He's going to grow you. He's going to transform you. He's planted you, and he's going to grow you. He knows what kind of sunlight to send. He knows the drought. He knows the rain. He knows what to do. So Onesimus, uh, if I don't even trust God in this, God's provision may be at work here. It may be in Romans 8.28. Have you considered that, Philemon? Um, verse number 16, he talks about this new relationship established because he got saved. Now, uh, Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother. He, he got saved. Philemon, he got saved. He's now a brother in Christ. Philemon, there's a difference when somebody's a Christian. 
And you know, it's the difference. Uh, yesterday I was working on a friend of mine, Kevin, his car, and uh, and the day before, because <laughs> then all goes planned. But uh, we do that, you know. And, and one of the things I talked to Kevin about was Christ and about the Lord. And him and his wife both have a profession of faith. Well, man, that makes it easy to help them, you know. And I run down to Worth Smith to, to get it, something, and it, it's 8 or $9. I just buy it, bring it back, and put it on his car. Why? He's a brother in Christ. That, how much easier should it be to give to somebody who's a Christian, right? I mean, that's, that's nothing. But guess what? I forgot my wallet. <laughs> Luckily, I know the people at Worth Smith, so I, I said, I'll, I'll come pay for this later. <laughs> and I left with it. <laughs> Went back later and paid him on the way to work. That work, forgetting your wallet things work great when you take somebody with you. But uh, when you're alone, it doesn't work. If you, if you count me, look at, look at verse number 17. If thou count me therefore a partner. How you think of me, I want you to think of him. Uh, uh, if you count me, then do this for me. If you can't do it for yourself, uh, uh, what do you think of me? I want you to, to try the best you can to put him in my stead. Okay? How you think of me, I want you to think of him. How you think of me? So, this, so the basis of the obedience is based upon your thoughts of Paul. Uh, uh, Philemon, do this according to how you think of me. If you count me this, then do this. And that's a, that's a big statement, right? Blame me for his wrong, verse 18. I know what he did was wrong. I'm not going to try to say what he did was right. If he wronged thee, of course he did. And owe thee all, of course he does. Put it on my account. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my place in his place. Okay? I want you to, when you look at him, I want you to see me. And if he owes you, I promise you, I'm coming and I will pay. Put it on my account. Do this. All right? In verse number 19, he says it very plainly. Uh, I, Paul, have written with my own hand. Now, we understand most of Paul's letters weren't written by him. He signed them, but Paul, we believe he might have had an eye problem because he oftentimes wrote very large, but that's not confirmed. Um, that might have been his thorn in the flesh, but we don't know. Um, it would be quite a thorn in the flesh for, for, for a preacher not to be able to read, right? Or not to be able to write. Uh, it could have been a shaking hand or something. Uh, so most of the time he dictated the, the Word of God. Wouldn't you like the person writing it? What would it have been like to write the Word of God? Uh, would you stumble in your faith? We say, oh, no, no, wait, cross that out. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if that happened or not. But, but this particular letter, Paul wrote with his own hand. And he says, uh, um, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. This is the most personal letter Paul ever will write. Hmm. I will repay it. Well, what do you think of me? Do you trust me? Trust me on this one, finally. I mean, trust me. I'll pay it. I'll bet. I do not say how they owe us my, even my own self. I'm not going to mention what you owe me. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, but he owes him a spiritual blessing, right? He owes him because he led him to Christ. You can count on me, he says. Blame me for his wrong. I will repay the debt. I know you, in verse number 20. Paul says, yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my body. He says, I know I know you, Philemon. I know what kind of person you are. Just be yourself. Just be yourself, because I know what kind of person you are. You might be having a bad day. Maybe you got out of bed, stubbed your toe. You know, how many of you know your emotions can sometimes lead you astray and make you not who you really are? All right, yeah. <laughs> you don't raise your hand at the time, brother. That's a bad time to raise your. <laughs> well, that's me. That's right. I'll mention your name for the internet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Somebody that you're not. I'm not knowing you that way, but I got mad, right? And uh, and that can happen. Right? So just be. Be who you are, because I know who you are. And then in verse number 21, I'm coming to see you soon. All right? No, that's not it. Uh, no, verse number 22. Prepare me a lodging, for I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. There's your introduction. Do I need to say anything else? Y'all got it, right? Y'all got it. If you're taking a personal application for the, from this, God bless you. If you're thinking, okay... I should be like Philemon. And I should listen as God enjoins me to do things for Christ's sake. I might not be able to like you, but I can like you for Christ's sake. Like I told the man when he fixed his car, I, we do this for Christ's sake. We do this for Jesus' sake. I'm not, you're getting the benefit, and I understand, and, and I like you, and I probably would do it anyway, because that's just, but God made me this way, but the reason I'm doing this is for Christ, not for you. 
You just happen to be the beneficiary. So if you want to thank somebody, thank Christ. And that's the whole idea. Don't thank me. Don't thank me. Right? If you knew who I was, you know, I'd steal from you. I'd lie to you. I, I, this is who I used to be. I was a salesman. Listen, I, you, you, when I looked at you, I looked at you as a means of income. And that's what a customer was to me. You were a means of income. But God has changed me now, right? And you're not a means of income. You're not a church member. You're not, you're not a, a, a notch in my belt, somebody I can win to Christ. You're loved by him, and I love him. So if you want to thank somebody, thank the one that changed me. Don't thank me. Because, because what I am, you wouldn't like very much. But, but what God has done. So and that's why when somebody says, well, hey, throw that in the offering then. Okay, we'll throw that in the offering. That's an offering to Christ. Well done. That's fine. Yeah. Thank God. Don't thank me. And, but you, maybe you need to be more like Philemon, and you draw that out of this book, and you draw that out of the Bible. Well, praise the Lord. God's used that in your life. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's great. Um, uh, or maybe you're like Paul, and you, you're, you, you want to encourage your children or your grandchildren, and you want to you feel like you, know, you can enjoin somebody. Now, if you think you're like Paul, uh, <laughs> that's an odd situation. But maybe, maybe there's a time you need to do some more work. But how many of you are affiliated with the slave? Right, you're the you're the slave. You're you're the, you're the one that stole and ran away, and uh, you're hoping it doesn't go so bad for you when you get back, right? Uh, which who are you in the story, right? And uh, the first thing I'm going to say to something like that, what would the first thing I say? How many of you know your pastor? What would I say? I say often, I say, find blank, and you'll find blank. Find Jesus, and you'll find. The story, the meaning, yes. So, uh, well, Andy was listening. Praise the Lord. And uh, <laughs> I know you all know that once you're refreshed on it. Find Christ. Find the meaning of the story. Okay? Find uh, Who's Christ in the story? Paul, who said that? Sharon said that. Okay, Sharon, you're done. No Kessels can speak, okay? And... Uh, <laughs> You did all your husband's homework. That's, I know that truth. And uh, uh, so, yes, Christ. I know you all feel it. Christ uh, is the one writing the letter. Who's he writing it to? Who's Philemon? What'd you say? Nothing. What? Close. Sharon's pointing to herself. She's saying something, but she won't admit it now. But somebody's saying a brother of Christ. Okay, here's. Philemon, now what we're doing is we look at the typology in our Bible and we understand the typology of our Bible and that brings out the meaning of the letter, okay? And the meaning of the letter, Philemon is God the Father, Paul is God the Son, and the runaway slave is Adam and his fallen race. And don't you dare stand before God without a letter in your hand from the Son. And the Son is telling you, you take my letter and you take it to God the Father. I know him. I know what he'll do. But you show up with this letter and you hand it to him. And on judgment day when you're scared to death and you're standing before the Lord and you know you're standing before the God of heaven, the omniscient God that knows you in and out. He knows every word you spoke, every thought you ever had. He knows you. Oh. And you say, you take this book. <laughs> Ye who would be under the law. God says, okay, thank you. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I don't need to read any more. You're going to hell. Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. Well, that's the third one. The second one is thou shalt make no graven image. Keep the Sabbath holy. Honor your father and mother. <sighs> How many are you doing on that one? All the days of your life. 
thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not swear, thou shalt not curse, thou shalt not... You want, to, you want to take that before God? Here's my letter. <laughs> okay, thank you. Here's my letter, God. By the grace of your Son, and by His blood. That's all I claim, God. That's all... Me. Look what it says here. Just look, look at what it is. Look at verse 12. God therefore receive him. Thou therefore receive him as my own bowels. Receive him. That is my own bowels. Receive him. Receive, um, look at verse number 15. Perhaps he is therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Look at verse number 16. Uh, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. Jesus Christ will say to God, they're special to me. Will you take them on my account? That's, do you see the letter? Do you see what this letter is? This letter is God the Son writing to God and he's writing to God in verse number 18. If this wicked sinner named Adam, if this Adam had Vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ. Vicarious means substitute. And you must believe in the substitute. He didn't show you the way to heaven. You don't fall. You can't follow Jesus to heaven. Are you kidding me? I got a book from the Jehovah Witnesses to follow Jesus to heaven. You've lost your mind. He showed us the way. Well, he did. Absolute perfection. Good luck. No, no, he took me to heaven. He stepped in my place and took the blame. It's the vicarious atonement. Right? That's that, Look what it says. It's, just, it's, it's amazing. Verse number 18, If he have wronged thee or owe thee up, put that on my account. I, Paul, written, I, It's about enjoining somebody whose love is perfect, whose, whose love uh, Where is it? I have it, so many things circled here. Look at verse 5. Hearing of thy love. Have you heard of God's love? It's everywhere, God's love. You don't hear much about his holiness, but you hear all about God's love. It's wonderful, his love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. The love of God to all the saints. He says, God, I hope... Here's one. Because I know who the Father is, I know what his reaction will be to the Son's request. I'm not going to lose my letter. i got a journey I'm heading on. A journey started in 1970 and it's going to end, I don't know, another 20 years maybe. I'm hoping for about three. But uh, the golden years are only golden for the doctors. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, what, what do I got? I'm 52 years old. Maybe I've got another, what, 30 years? Something like that. And then I'm out. I'm, I'm gone, right? And this journey, uh, uh, I've got this, this letter that Christ gave me when I was 14. And in that letter is a promise. But here's the good news is, picture this guy uh, who's carrying the letter. Who's carrying the letter? Anisiphorus, or Anisimus. The slave is carrying the letter. But you know what he's carrying? Imagine this. Okay, he's in Rome. Now you see Italy in your mind. You see the boot, right? And it's kicking, what's it kicking? Sicily, right? And uh, so you see Italy in your mind. You see Rome right up there, kind of towards the middle, halfway up the lake. And, and there's Rome, right? And, uh, and now he's got to take this to Colossae. Anybody can picture Colossae in your mind? 
There's a map in the back of your Bible. You can find out what, it's up there in Asia Minor, the idea of Turkish area. And uh, so he's going to head over to Turkey. Now that's a journey, right? Anybody want to walk from Rome to Turkey? Right? Yeah. Joey wa Joe wants to ride, walk. Okay. It would be cool. I'd go with you. Right? We'll carry Bibles. We'll never make it. Right? I mean, the Muslims will kill us long before we get across there. So um, that's a journey, right? And he's, but what's he got in his hand? He's got the Word of God. <laughs> what's the chances of that getting lost? Right? What's the chances of thieves getting in and getting it? Right? I mean, would God strike him with lightning? I don't know what God would do if somebody tried to steal the Word of God, but he's carrying the Word of God. He doesn't know it's the Word of God, most likely, but he's got a letter from Paul. It's the most precious thing. It's his life. It's his life. What's the life? The promise the Son gave to the Father. Your salvation, your life, your eternal life is based on a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. You're just the beneficiary. God the Father will receive you into heaven because of the Son. It's not because of you. If it's because of you, you'd never get in. Does God want you in heaven? Yes. No. Not like you are. Does God want you in heaven cleansed? Yes. Why would he do that on behalf of Christ? Right? If you get... See, humanism has entered in and entered into our education system so strongly that you think everything's about you. Right? It's about the Son and the Father. And that's why I can't lose my salvation. It's a covenant between God the Son and God the Father. God the Son says that God the Father has promised him all that the Father hath given to me. I will rise up. It's between God the Father and God the Son. I've got the Son's letter and his promise to me that I will be received of the Father. I go to him, not as Dan Mills, I go to him as one carrying faith in Christ. And that faith in Christ, God the Father, God the Son, have a covenant which is unbreakable that anybody in his name will be received. Anybody washed in his blood, anybody that he has paid for will be received by God the Father. It's a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. God the Holy is an omniscient God. God And that's why I can't lose it. That's why it can't go away. Why? Because I've stepped in. And that covenant is secure. And I stand before God. Right? You ever meet somebody trying to keep the Ten Commandments? I have plenty of people. Lots of people. You know, I do the best I can. I mean, God can't expect more than that. Yes, He can. He can expect perfection. And He does. How y'all doing? Do you know anybody that was? I do. He's the Son of God. He lived a perfect and sinless life. The Bible said, He that knew no sin became sin. It said He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And they took that lamb and they brought that lamb into their house and God said, live with it for four days and inspect it. You ever, anybody watch, go on the Google sometime, Google it, not now in church, but Google it sometime, and, and do the lamb inspection by the Jews. I mean, they take the thing, they open it up, they twist it around, and they inspect every inch of that lamb to make sure it's a perfect lamb for sacrifice. You know why they did it, right? Because they, they want to find something wrong with the lamb. Why? So they could sell you one of theirs. And religion became a money thing. And Jesus went in and cleansed out the temple, right? Why? Because you made my father's house a house of thieves. Right? So you were rejecting all these lamps, so that way you could sell them one. Hey, I got a pretty one here. This one's kosher. It's already accepted. Right? And uh, I know it's missing a leg, but it's already been inspected. And that, that's the money racket that came in religion. But the actual inspection, it was a, a serious inspection. Anybody see him looking for the red heifer? There's a guy trying to raise the red heifer. And uh, if they get the red heifer, now when, they, when the red heifers are born now, they're, they're mostly red, and they inspect that thing in and out. They haven't found one yet without blemish. Right? If they ever find the red heifer, what happens? Right? Instant war in the Middle East. Israel, Israel bombs the, the, the Muslims. Right? 
I mean, Israel's building a temple. Israel's cleansing a priesthood. Israel, I mean, we know what happens if, they, if a red heifer is born that's pure and spotless, right? They burn that sucker, and they put them in some water, and they cleanse the priesthood. They cleanse the temple mount. They cleanse everything, right? And now they're ready to go in. Why does everything need cleansed in the Old Testament? Because everything's filthy. So we know what, hap what's, what would happen at that time, right? But uh, uh, let's see. Go back to Philemon. I like to study those things anyway. Google it. Watch the inspection. Jesus is the spotless, sinless lamb that was slain on my behalf. And between him and God, there's a covenant. And if I step in, I'm received. And that's what this letter is. I want you to take this letter and just read through it. Don't run through it. And forget about the, the, the old times and how the slave, you're the slave, or Adam. If you, if you don't like putting yourself in this Onismus, look at Adam. And when Adam sinned, and, and Adam took of that fruit from Eve, and about four months later, he's standing before God. Could have been five months. We have some arguments about how long, how long was between Adam and Eve's sin. And Adam's standing there, and he knows what he's got to do. And he's made a decision, and the decision was wrong. And he hearkened to the voice of his wife. And nobody has yet to tell me what his wife said. Joe said, curse God and die. He's thinking it's Job's wife. He's wrong, but he's close. And uh, getting there. What, is, what did Eve say to Adam that Adam listened to and stepped in? Now, don't tell Joe. Oh, he might be watching. No, he's sick. She said, join me. Don't leave me alone. Join me. That was her cry. Oh, someday we'll find it in the Bible. And Adam stepped in and joined his wife. And God said, because you hearkened to the voice of your wife, and instead of the, the commandment that I've given you, you listened to her voice instead of mine. All right? The curse fell. And a letter was written. And that slave stole what was God's, and fled. And now Christ came, and that slave and Christ have met, and that slave is returning to God with a letter in his hand. And now as you read Philemon, know what it's about. And as this jumps off the page to you, you'll start seeing more and more. Listen, we, we've hardly skimmed the surface of Philemon, of what is in this book. Now, Paul or Christ writing this letter is the Good Samaritan. This is who the Good Samaritan is. You're not the Good Samaritan. Don't misapply it. Okay, if you get something and you say, well, I should be a Good Samaritan. Okay, okay, that's great. You should be a nice neighbor. You should be a nice person. And I, I'll be Paul and I'll try to receive somebody and help somebody else get received, right? Uh, I'll, I'll try to do it. That's great. That's wonderful. You want to help people. You want to do stuff. You should do that anyway. And I hope you do that even before you got saved. But what this book is about, this book is about the redemption of a, of a fallen race and how God is going to redeem them. Philemon is the father. Paul is the son, and you are the sinner who's saved by grace. And you're walking back to Philemon, and you're scared to death on your judgment day, and you're going to stand before the Almighty, and God says, knowing the terror of the Lord, and you're going to be more scared than you ever were. It's a mortal fear like nothing you've ever felt before. It's the fear that Adam said, I was afraid. Afraid of what? An omniscient God that knows everything. And was it real? Will I enter in? And all you have is a promise from one man who said, I am the Son of God. I promise you, you go in my name, you'll be received. You go in another's name, you go in the law, you'll never make it. But trust me, you go in my name, you'll be received. And that's what this is. This is your letter. It's your ticket to heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the truth of God's word. Thank you, God. Is somebody here not saved? Somebody watching not saved? trusting in Christ, Some, somebody thinks they're good? Oh, Father, reveal to them the truth. They'll never make it through judgment. And let them be saved. I pray for that, Lord. May Christians be encouraged in what they are doing for the Lord. Our, our faith grow, knowing the confidence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this little book, this little 25 verses that shows us, Lord, who you are. Thank you for being the good Samaritan, caring about the one in the ditch, caring about the runaway slave, Thank you, Lord. I pray for God's people today. Everybody here is dealing with something. Everybody here is dealing with life. And it's just not much fun all the time.
But God, I pray you strengthen them in their journey, strengthen them in their walk, and uh, teach them, Lord, to, to keep their eyes upon Christ, to be lifted up. I pray this might be a day of spiritual strengthening. And we need this every every Sunday, God. We need spiritual strength. And I pray you do that, Lord, to help them where they're at, help them where they are. Thank you, Lord. Bless this time as we sing. Let the invitation be clear in Jesus' name. Amen. As God leads, you do as God tells you what to do. And uh, if you're not saved and you're watching online, I want you to contact me. I want to help you. 814-331-6452 is my number. Just contact me. Text me. You don't have to tell me your name. Just tell me your, some questions about the Lord. We can text back and forth or you can call me. Um, you, feel free to use that number. Everybody in this church, of course, that number is free to you. Let's stand and, let, and let's sing. Page 223. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thank you.